Tonight in Acts chapter 10, I want to emphasize the importance of this chapter. This is a very, very, very key strategic chapter. And that simply stated, this is the chapter which the Gospel goes officially to the Gentiles. Now that may not seem like any great big deal to you, but in the early church, the believers were first Jewish. And the racial prejudice that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles was enormous. Far greater than anything that we have or we experience in our world today. The world was divided into those two categories. There were the Jews and there were the Gentiles. And neither of them had anything to do with one another. And the hatred that Jews had for the Gentiles was so very, very great. Needless to say that Jesus was a Jew and that the early Christians were Jewish, but yet the Gospels for the whole world. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and Jesus had said that we were to go into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. And He told them in the book of Acts before He ascended to heaven that when the Spirit of God comes upon you, that you'll be My witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But they hadn't really gone out officially to preach to the Gentiles and to welcome them into the church and didn't realize that the church was a new humanity. That it wasn't just Jews, it wasn't just Gentiles, it wasn't just men, it wasn't just women, but it was men, women, Jews, Gentiles, all races, all people, and that we are all one in Jesus Christ. Great parallel passage tonight is Ephesians chapter 2, if we get time, after looking at 48 verses, and you're probably thinking, if you're going to cover 48 verses, you better get rocking and rolling, Pastor John. But in that chapter, he talks about how God has taken the Gentile and the Jew and broken down the wall and made one new humanity, one new man, and that is the church. The church is an amazing thing, and it's so awesome to realize that in the church that we're one, Jew and Gentile, and that we have an equal standing before a holy and righteous God. Now, we've seen three conversions, concluding tonight will be number three, in Acts chapters 8, 9, and 10. And in that chapter 8, we saw the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And interesting that each one of these conversions, they were very religious, but they were lost. He was a man who came to Jerusalem to seek the God of Israel, gone back in his chariot reading the prophet Isaiah, and then Philip came running alongside of his chariot. Do you understand what you read? He says, how can I let someone guide me? And he jumped up in the chariot and began to share with him Christ, and he accepted Jesus and was baptized and went on his merry way. And then we saw in chapter 9 the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Very religious man. Hated Christians. Persecuted Christians. But he was a Jew who was a Pharisee and very religious. And then tonight in chapter 10 we get the conversion of Cornelius who was a religious man as well. He was a Gentile who was believed to be a proselyte into Judaism. And he was a man who was really seeking the Lord and praying and giving alms and probably believed in the God of Israel, but he was again lost and needed the good news of Jesus Christ. Now I want to back up one verse, chapter 9, verse 43, to introduce us to chapter 10. Luke says, It came to pass that he tarried, that is Peter, many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. Now, I threw a map on the screen for you last week. We won't do that tonight, but Joppa is on the seacoast. And it's over from the, it's over to the west of Jerusalem, right along the seacoast. And the tanner was a man that would, you know, use uh, uh, the skins of animals to create, you know, uh, canvases and he would make, make tents with them. He was one who skinned animals, so he was an unclean kind of profession. They, they couldn't tan animals or skin animals and still be kind of set apart for God and worship in the temple or go to the synagogue and things like that. So Peter's already kind of doing stuff that's a little bit radical as far as their sanctity for the Jews are concerned. But 
the fact that he's with this man's name Simon, who's a tanner in the city of Joppa, comes into play when Cornelius gets directions to call for Peter that he come to him and share the gospel. But begin with me in verses 1 to 8 where we have God preparing Cornelius for the gospel. It says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a satyrian of the band called the Italian band. He was a devout man, one that feared God with all of his house, which gave must alms to the people and prayed to God always. And he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour, which is three o'clock in the afternoon. I'll come back to that. He said he saw in the vision this angel of God coming to him and saying to him, Cornelius. Interesting, God knows our name. He called him by name Cornelius. And when he had looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. Now, send to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose name is Peter. So there was Simon the Tanner, and there was Simon Peter. They both had the same name. One was the Tanner, the other was the Apostle Peter. Now, he lodges with one Simon the Tanner, verse 6, whose house is by the seaside. Tanners would often be by water so they could use it for cleansing and washing and so forth of the skins. And he shall, he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and devout soldier of them, and he waited on them continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, Cornelius in verse 1 was a Roman centurion. A centurion was a Roman general. He was a soldier who was over a group of men. And in the Bible, whenever you find centurions, they're always presented in a good light. They're always good men, modest men, moral men, uh, helpful men. And that's the case with Cornelius. It says that he was over a band called the Italian band. Now, this isn't a rock band. This isn't a music group. The word is a reference to a cohort or a group of soldiers numbering about 100. So he was over about 100 soldiers known as a Roman cohort. Now, he was in the city of Caesarea, which is north of Joppa, about 20, about 20, 27 miles. Actually, next week, about this same time, we'll be in the city of Joppa and we'll be in the city of Caesarea. And it's going to be awesome. We're going to actually do the same Bible study overlooking the ocean in the city of Caesarea, right where Cornelius was. We'll see where Joppa is, where Peter was, and it all comes into kind of view. But this Roman garrison, this Roman fortress, and we'll see the harbor that was built by Herod the Great. But notice it says there that he was a devout man, one that feared God with all of his house, and he gave much alms to the people, and he prayed to God always. Now, there's a lot that could be said and pointed out about Cornelius and his devotion, but I want to get right to the point. And the point is, is that he was devout, he was religious, he was a man who prayed, he believed in the God of Israel, but, but don't miss this, he needed to be saved. He needed the gospel. A lot of times people complain that you Christians go to these other nations and their culture and you... You share Christianity with them and they have their own religion and their religion is just as good as yours and you don't really need to do that. You should leave them alone and respect their culture and respect their religion and that kind of a thing. But this makes it very clear that even though he was religious, he was lost. Even though he believed in God, he wasn't saved. Now, some of you were here Sunday morning and we looked at the book of James and we talked about faith that without works is dead. And James mentions that even demons believe in God and they tremble, but obviously they're not saved. So orthodoxy or believing in God or having correct belief doesn't save anyone. It's faith in Jesus Christ who died and was buried and rose again and being born again. It was Nicodemus, the religious Jew, in John 3 that Jesus 
said to him, Nicodemus, you have to be born again if you're going to see the kingdom of God. Sometimes we get the idea that, oh, they're religious, oh, they don't need God, they don't need Christianity. I need to preach to them they're very religious, but it's possible to be very, very religious, but yet be lost. John Wesley is a great example in church history. He came to America to convert the Indians, left, go back, went back to England, dejected and discouraged, wrote in his journal, went to America to convert the Indians, but who shall convert me, he wrote. And on his trip back to England, he was on the ship with some other believers. They were called Moravians. They were like early evangelical Christians. They were born again and loved Jesus. And a storm hit the ship, and Wesley was observing these Moravians, the peace that they had, and that they weren't afraid to die. And, and he was worried and frightened, and he was unsure of his salvation, even though he was quite devout and fasted and prayed and read his Bible and came to be a missionary. And so when he got back to England, he wanted to know what they had that he didn't have, so he made his way one night in London to a Moravian meeting, and he slipped in the back late, and the minister was reading the preface to Martin Luther's commentary in the book of Romans. And he made reference to the fact that you can be saved or justified by faith and trusting Christ. And Wesley then, after that meeting that night, hurrying the gospel for the first time, he said, I did trust Christ and Christ alone for my salvation. And he said, I felt my heart strangely warm. And that was the conversion of John Wesley began the Methodist church and the Methodist movement, the great work that God used him in England. At the same time, George Whitfield was in America preaching the gospel and there was great revival. But it is possible, as we see so often, for a person to be very devout and very pious and very religious, but indeed very lost, and such was the case with this man we call Cornelius. It's believed that he was what was called a, a, a proselyte of the gate, that he, he hadn't fully entered into Judaism, but he believed in the God of Israel, and he was reading Scripture and following after him as best that he knew how, but obviously he would be ostracized by the Jews and wouldn't be able to fully enter in, and was looking for something. He was a hungry heart, and God always meets a hungry heart. God always reaches a hungry heart. The Bible says that if you seek Him with all your heart, you will find Him. And I believe that those that really want to know God, that God will come to them and reveal Himself to them and meet them in their need. And we see in this whole story, it's one long story. It actually goes into chapter 11, and we see the providential hand of God in orchestrating uh, Cornelius' conversion and preparing Peter to preach the gospel to him. So he was praying at the end of verse 2, and at ninth hour he saw a vision. Verse 3. In the ninth hour, as I said, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Jews prayed three times a day which kind of convicted me today. I thought, well, if the Jews could pray in their religion three times a day, why can't I pray, you know, in the morning, noon, and evening at least, you know, spend that time. So at 9 o'clock in the morning, at 12 o'clock at noon, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they would pray. So he was going through his little prayer at the 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And here we have another angel in the book of Acts, verse 3. An angel of God came to him and said to him, Cornelius... These angels are amazing to me. And this angel said, or he looked at this angel and he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to them, your prayers and your alms have been heard. They've come up as a memorial before God. The angel then instructed Cornelius to send down to Joppa, south of, uh, of Caesarea, 27 miles to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he lodges one Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he shall tell thee what thou shalt do. In chapter 11, we're going to learn when Peter recounts this story. And by the way, this story is told about another three or four times, and that's because Luke felt that it was important for us to get, is that he says that he will tell you all the words of this life, all the things you need to know about salvation. So when the angel which spake to Cornelius was departed, he says he called two of his household servants and devout soldier of them that waited on him continually, and he had declared unto these things, and he sent them to Joppa. Now, 
A second point I want to make that's very important. Notice that the angel did not preach the Gospel to Cornelius. You're thinking, dude, you're right there. You just came from God. Why don't you just tell Cornelius what he needs to know about Jesus Christ? But God has actually chosen, why I don't know, but ordained that the Gospel be preached through sinners who have been saved. That God wants to use you, God wants to use me, God wants to use us to tell other people. If you've got a heathen neighbor and you're praying, God, send, in, send Gabriel to my neighbor across the street to ring their doorbell and to share the Gospel with them, it ain't going to happen. God wants you to go over there to open your mouth and to share with them. So the angel says, send to Joppa for Peter. Peter will come. He'll tell you all the words of this life. He'll share the Gospel with you. And how amazing that God would actually allow us to be His servants and His instruments and His mouthpieces and that we would get to share the Gospel of Jesus Christ with those who need to hear. So verses 1-8 to eight are Peter or Cornelius' preparation. And then verses 9-22 to 22 is the preparation of Peter to come and to preach the Gospel. Now on the morrow as they went to their journey, that it would take them a little bit to get there, probably a couple of days, they drew nigh, or at least a day and a half, they drew nigh to the city, and Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now this was the noontime prayer. Remember I told you tw uh, 12 noon and 3 in the afternoon, as well as 9 in the morning. So it's noontime, and they're right on the coast at Joppa, and it's a beautiful spot right on the Mediterranean Sea. And the houses were flat, and you could get on the patio on the roof. And what, 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 what cooler place to go up and to pray and to take a nap than on the top of a flat roofed house on the beach overlooking the Mediterranean Ocean. So he went up there to pray, and it was about the sixth hour. By the way, Cornelius was praying, and God came and spoke to him. And Peter was praying, and God came and spoke to him. Guess what? God comes and speaks to us when we pray. Amen? Even though we're praying, God speaks to us. In prayer, I think it can be both ways. We speak to God, and God speaks to us. And God can teach us and reveal things to us as we're spending time in prayer. Now, he became very hungry. And he would have eaten, but while they were making ready, he fell into a trance. So, it was noon, he was on the beach, he was on the roof, he was tired, he was praying, all the makings, and they were cooking the lunch downstairs, and the aroma was coming up. Remember those old cartoons when they put the pie in the window and the smoke would turn into a finger and draw people in, you know? And you'd be smelling the pie. So I, I see that in my sanctified imagination. You know, the aromas, probably baking lamb downstairs, and the aromas coming up, and the fingers are pulling Peter down. And, he's like, and he has this dream when he's up on this roof. He says that he goes into a trance. Now this is so, so important. He saw heaven open, verse 11, and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowl of the air. And there came a voice to Peter saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, that call not thou common. Now this happened, verse 16, three times. And then the vessel was received up again, Unto heaven. When Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry into Simon's house and stood before at the gate. Probably an outside courtyard. They couldn't get to the actual house, so they were probably yelling out from the gate, Is there one named Simon Peter who is here? And so it says that he called and they asked whether Simon, which is surnamed Peter, were lodging there, while Peter thought on this vision. Now notice it carefully, verse 19. The Spirit said, 
unto him, Behold, three men seek for thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you're seeking. What cause therefore do you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one that fears God, as good report of all the nations of the Jews, was warned by God by a holy angel to send for thee unto this house and to hear thee and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in, verse 23, which is an amazing thing that Peter, being a Jew, would even invite these Gentiles to come into the house with them. So he called them in to lodge, and on the next day Peter went away with them after certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, just stop right there in verse 23. So first we have the preparation of Cornelius. God sends an angel, tells him to send for Peter. Then Peter is down by the seaside. He's at Simon the Tanner's house, and they're going to fix lunch. So he goes, I'm going to go up on the roof and pray. And while he was praying, he fell asleep, which seems to be kind of a pattern for Peter, by the way. Remember what he did when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane? If you ever fallen asleep while you're praying, well, you're in good company. The Apostle Peter has joined you. Remember, Peter was praying and Jesus said, what, could you not watch with me one hour? Rise, Peter, watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And here he is again. He's up on the housetop and he's hungry and they're cooking the meal and he falls asleep. But God gives Peter a vision. Now, it's interesting that God works on both ends. He speaks to Cornelius and he speaks to Peter and he brings the two together. God didn't just speak to Cornelius and then he had to convince Peter. God didn't just speak to Peter and he had to convince Cornelius. God worked at both ends. If you feel like God's calling you into ministry or to minister to someone, you can expect God to work at both ends. That God not only prepares you, but God prepares the recipients. That God not only prepares you the messenger, but God prepares those who receive the message. And that you can pray, God, go before me and speak to hearts and prepare the soil and open the hearts. And God brought the two of them together. Again, the hand of God in working in this situation. So while Peter's on the rooftop, he gets a vision. And in this vision, it's this great big blanket or sheet. And on the four corners, there's a ropes and it's let down from heaven. And if you have a hard time visualizing it, then just get you know, the Bible in picture for little eyes or you know, get some kind of action Bible for little kids. And that, believe it or not, I, I, I actually read these little kid Bibles with pictures and illustrations because it gets the juices flowing. You know, you can actually see it happening. So here's this sheet and it's coming down. And then on this big sheet, there's all these animals that Levitical, Le, Levitical law condemns as unclean. So they were not kosher. They, 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 they weren't, they weren't uh, ceremonially clean animals that the Jews can eat. It says there were four-footed beasts, the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air. Now, isn't it interesting that he's on the roof of whose house? Simon the what? What do tanners do? They kill animals. Probably a lot of creepy animals. And he probably saw carcasses hanging all around the place, you know, and it was kind of in his brain. And he went up there and he had this dream. But it was really the hand of God. But I, I, I probably shouldn't tell you the story, but I, I'll never forget. It was, I don't know how many years ago. I've been around so long now I forget. It was probably 30 years ago. I was in China. I made several trips into China. And we're in this little border town of China in, in, over from Hong Kong. It's called Canton. And if you've never been into China and experienced a meat market, you've never experienced a meat market. They eat everything. I mean everything. Little sparrows and lizards and snakes and frogs and all kinds of creepy things and dogs. And a lot of them are alive. They're actually, you know, chirping and barking and whining and fussing. And, I, I, and whenever time I read the story of all these animals, all these creepy things, all these unclean things, I immediately, I'm back in the meat market in Canton, China. I see all these creepy things. I remember there was this one big box full of turtles. 
and they were alive, and one of them got out, and we were screaming, run, little turtle, run, little turtle. Run for your life, you know. <laughs> He's trying to get out of there. But we, we actually saw dogs hanging on hooks. They eat, they eat dog, and the delicacy over there is black dog. It's, in the, it's on the menu. You go and open the menu, you can have black dog in the restaurant. So that's what happened to Peter. This sheet comes down, and all these things that you would, oh, I don't, I don't eat that. All these creepy animals are on the sheet, and then the Lord speaks to Peter and says, get up, kill it, and eat it. Now, what Peter does is a classic oxymoron, classic, so to speak, contradiction. He says, not so, Lord. Excuse me, Peter. You can say, not so, and you can say, Lord, but you can't say, not so, Lord. Because if he's Lord, it's whatever you say goes. It's yes, Lord, but you can't say, not so, Lord. And here he is arguing with the Lord, which is kind of like Peter again. It's classic Peter. When Jesus said that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be crucified and slain. What did Peter say? Not so, Lord. That shall not happen to you. And Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan, because you're not saying the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So here's Peter again arguing with God. But as I pointed out, these are things that were, according to Levitical law, Leviticus 11, were ceremonially unclean, and no Jew would, would eat these things. But God was making it clear. Now, in this vision... And I'll just kind of spill the beans, but you'll see it unfold. God was showing Peter that he was saving Gentiles. These creepy animals represented God saving the Gentiles, what the Jews considered to be unclean and they, that they rejected. God was actually saying, that which I have cleansed, call not thou common or unclean. This was all preparation to get Peter and the other Jews to be willing to preach the gospel to these Gentiles. So the P Peter hears the Spirit speak. Jump down to verse 19. Again, this is the gospel of the Spirit, and here's the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. So the Holy Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men will seek you. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now, again, a little footnote, important thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is the divine person. And what you see here is the Holy Spirit speaking and the Holy Spirit guiding and the Holy Spirit directing. So it's, it, it, it implies what the Bible teaches, the doctrine of the personality of the Holy Spirit and the importance of the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. Now, no sooner had Peter received this word, he didn't understand what God was trying to say by just seeing the animals on the sheet and the vision, but the Holy Spirit made it very clear to him. So the vision kind of left him kind of wondering, but then the Spirit made it very, very clear what God was doing. I want you to go with these men. And the minute God said that, knock, 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 they're at the door. God's timing is amazing, isn't it? The minute God spoke to him, preparing his heart, these guys are at the door. Now we see the obedience of Peter to go in verse 23 down to verse 33. and says, Then called he them in, and he lodged with them. And again, that would be unthinkable for a Jew to hang out with a Gentile. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now he took some other Jewish Christian brothers with him, because no doubt he realized that he was going to be in hot water. And that's what happens in chapter 11. The other Jews that are Christians in Jerusalem, the other leaders in the church, they call Peter in and they're real upset with him. They go, we, we heard you went to Gentiles and preached to them. And you ate with them and you hung out with them. Don't you realize you're going to get cooties? It's not in the text, I just threw that in there. And he tells the story about the Spirit told me to go, who was I to resist the Holy Spirit? So after that, they says that they entered into Caesarea, verse 24. And Cornelius waited for them, and he called together his kinsmen and his near friends. So not only 
did Cornelius want to hear what Peter had to say, but he wanted his friends and his family to hear as well. We should have the same heart to, to share the gospel and to invite friends to come to church and to hear the good news. So as Peter was coming in, verse 25, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up, my, stand up, I myself also am a man. Peter realized that that was a, a dangerous thing. I, I'm just a man. You don't want to worship me. Obviously, Peter was not uh, the Pope. He didn't want to be worshipped or venerated. He was just a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, You know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come to one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I have come to you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for, and I ask you therefore for what intent you have sent for me. Now, here's Peter. He makes contact with Cornelius, sees all the people there in the house, and it's not the best way to first start your witness to this unbelieving Gentile group by saying, you know, it's not right for me to be here because you all have cooties kind of a thing. I just want you all to know that I'm not supposed to be here. You're all unclean, but... God told me to come, so I'm here. And he still kind of wonders what's going on. Tell me why you have called for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, a reference to the angel, and said, Cornelius, thy prayers heard, and thine alms there hid, had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose name or surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of one Simon a tanner by, sea, by the seaside, who when he comes shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things that are commanded thee of God. Now, this is what I, what I call a preacher's dream come true. An entire group of people prepared by God, eager to hear, their ears are open, they're listening, they're focused, they're not falling asleep, they're not looking at their watch, they're not checking their phones, they're listening, they're dialed in, and they said, you know, we're all here to hear, we're all here to receive what God has to say, we're all here to, to, to know what words you want to speak to us. And any preacher would be over the moon thinking about this, that this congregation of people are ready and they're hungry and they're eager. Now Peter then therefore opened his mouth, verse 34, and we have the preaching of Peter down to verse 48. So Peter opened his mouth and he said, of a truth I perceive, and here's actually the one of the main lessons of the whole chapter, that God is no respect of persons. Isn't that great? That God does not show partiality. Peter's saying, I am blown away to realize that, that God does not show respect of persons. But in every nation, verse 35, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now don't misunderstand verse 35. He's not saying that wherever you go in the world, that if people fear God and do good deeds, that God will forgive them and accept them. What he's trying to convey in verse 35 is actually that God is no respecter of persons. That anyone who repents and turns to Him and believes in Him can be saved in spite of what nation or ethnic background they're from. That's what he's saying in verse 35. So then in verse 36, it says, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, that He is Lord of all. That word, I say, we know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, 
who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of these things which he hath done in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew, referring to Christ, and hung on a tree. It's a reference to the cross. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us. He's speaking of his post-resurrection appearances, whom did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach the gospel and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the alive and the dead. And to him gave all the prophets witness, and through his name, notice it carefully, verse 43, whosoever, whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. Now again, this is the lesson that God had taught Peter here. That doesn't matter who you are, Jew or Gentile, whosoever believes in him will have remission of sins. Sins. Now, this is an awesome sermon that Peter preaches. It could be an abbreviation uh, record that we have by Luke here. But Peter starts off talking about the word God sent unto the children of Israel. It's interesting that in this story, you have the Spirit of God calling a man of God who preaches the word of God so that people can come to believe in God. I don't believe that God's methods have changed. Spirit of God using a man of God to preach the Word of God to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. So Peter preached. There's no substitute for the preaching of God's Word through His servant. And so he speaks about Jesus' life and ministry and death and resurrection. Let me point them out. In verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with Him. That's God the Father with God the Son. And so it's His life and His ministry summarized in that statement. And then in verse 39, we have His death. And when we're preaching the Gospel, we should always focus on the person of Christ and His death on the cross. So he says, and we are witnesses of all things that he did that both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, and they slew and hung him on a tree. So we have his life and ministry. We have his death, his substitutionary death on the cross, and then his resurrection in verse 40. And him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. So his death and his resurrection and the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and that He was seen after He rose. And then He gives the proofs that were witnesses chosen before of God, even to us which did eat and drink with Him after He rose from the dead. Peter and the others on the Sea of Galilee as Jesus was roasting the fish and they came and they ate there and they fellowshiped there and they saw Him after He had risen from the dead. And then he points out that soon he will be the coming judge. And it says he commanded us to preach, verse 42, unto the people and testify that it is he which is ordained of God to be the judge of the alive and the dead. That Jesus will one day come back and he will judge the alive and the dead. And then verse 43 says, and to him gave he all the prophets witness. So, He was a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets. That through His name, whosoever believes in Him shall receive remission of sins. So basically, right then and there is where Peter was starting to to make application. That whosoever, you Jews, you Gentiles, whoever wants to believe, whosoever can come. Put that verse, verse 43, alongside John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will never perish but have everlasting life. I believe in a whosoever gospel. And whosoever means whosoever, by the way. means whoever will believe will be saved. God won't turn anyone away. Now, while Peter yet spake, 
In other words, Peter was long-winded. So I follow in Peter's train. Peter was going long. Peter kept preaching. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, enough is enough, Peter. You, uh, you need to wrap this up. So the Holy Spirit fell on all them which heard the Word. And that's what we want as well. God's Spirit to fall on those that are hearing the Word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For, this is how they knew, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered and said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Now that's not giving us a formula. They no doubt baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as Jesus had instructed. But they baptize them into the Lord and in His authority. Then prayed they Him to tarry for certain days. Now, this is the cool ending or conclusion. And the story goes on into chapter 11, by the way. And we'll pick it up when we get back from Caesarea and Joppa and the places that we're reading about right now. But the story continues in the chapter 11 where Peter gets in trouble for going to these Gentiles. And the church still continues to struggle with this idea of letting Gentiles come in on an equal standing as the Jews. But while Peter was speaking, he didn't even get to say, I want every head bowed and every eye closed. And if you're here right now and you want Jesus Christ, raise your hand. It kind of messed him up. He, you know, he got out of rhythm here. He went, it, 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 just, it, just, it just kind of threw him for a curve. He's still speaking, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit fell on all these Gentiles. And the whole group, I, I, I don't know how many there were, probably a good-sized house that Cornelius the centurion owned. Everyone in this group, all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. Now, what I want you to notice is that different than earlier episodes in the book of Acts where the apostles had to come down and lay hands on the Samaritans and after they were converted, then they received the Spirit and there was a time lapse and all that took place. Or Paul had to have Ananias lay his hands on him and receive the Holy Spirit. What I want you to notice is that there's really no pattern that you can develop through the book of Acts as to how people are saved and the Holy Spirit works and if you do want to have a pattern, I think that Cornelius would be a good one for the church today in that there was no interval between their believing and their receiving the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't say that they even prayed or asked God to give them the Holy Spirit. And there were no hands laid on them. And there was no fire or cloven tongues over them like Acts chapter 2. But they did hear them speak in tongues. And the Bible says that tongues were a sign for the Jews. Certainly it stood for a sign for these Christian Jews to realize God was saving Gentiles. And you've got to understand that that was a very difficult thing for them to believe. Actually, they believed in their Jewishness that God had only created Gentiles as fuel for the fires of hell. They were fodder for the fires of hell. That's the only reason God created Gentiles. And Gentiles couldn't go to heaven. That Abraham stood at the gate of heaven, and if any Gentile tried to come in, he would turn them away. They, they, they referred to them as dogs, the Gentile dogs. But the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles. And there's no division. The wall has been broken down, and we who were strangers are now made fellow citizens of the household of God. We're New habitation, we're a building of God inhabited by the Holy Spirit. You can read all that in Ephesians, the second chapter. But how marvelous it is that those who believe in Him receive the forgiveness of their sins, verse 43, and the gift, verse 45, of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You don't have to plead. You don't have to beg. You don't have to wait. You don't have to tarry. 
You don't need an apostle to lay their hands upon you that if you trust in Jesus Christ, He'll forgive your sins. He'll come into your heart by the Holy Spirit. He'll fill you with His Spirit and with His power. What a marvelous thing that is. God saves you by His grace and He gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so Peter is amazed that God saved these Gentiles. Now what this is doing, it's conditioning the Christians to realize that the Gospel is universal. The Gospel isn't just for Americans. The Gospel isn't just for Westerners. The Gospel isn't just for you know, people in the United States or in the Western Hemisphere. The Gospel is for every tribe, every kindred, every nation, every tongue, and every people. And it took several years for Peter and these guys to, to get out to these Gentiles, and God had to send an angel to Cornelius and send a vision to Peter to get him going. May God help us to get going. We still have work to do, amen? There's still people who need to hear. There's people right here in our nation and in other places that need to hear the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Great Commission is still just that, a commission for us to go into all the world and preach the Gospel. We need to pray, we need to give, we need to serve, and we need to go and do all we can to get the Gospel out to every tribe, every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. And when we get to heaven, we're going to see people from all nationalities. <laughs> and the church is a reflection of that right now. But when we get to heaven, there's not going to be different sections of different countries and border walls and people living over here and there, you know, and... We're all going to be one in Jesus Christ. Redeemed from every kindred, tribe, nation, and tongue. And a glorious truth that is. Let's pray.